What is going on, y'all? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. Uh, it's me, it's Cam, and I survived. I'll tell you what almost killed me. <laughs> but uh, joining me, as always, it's me, amigo, <laughs> Filio. Uh, Philly? Yes, sir. Uh, how's things going, man? I am doing good. Thank you to everyone out there that gave me birthday wishes. I had a good birthday. Uh, it was a good time. I saw the post that you had made over there. Uh, I don't even know where you got that photograph. I stole it from uh, one of your mother's posts. And what I started to do was I started to put missing <laughs> and stick it on there. Because <laughs> it looks like a missing kids photo. Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 I, that's a, a photo when I actually used to have hair. I had blonde hair, to, uh, believe it or not. Is that one of those it's photos crazy, too right? back like with, with, with my mother and all that stuff? Is that back when your mom used to make your clothes? Yeah, 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 and you would go to like Kmart or something. They'd like pull down a different background. Yeah, yeah. you know, and that was pretty much because it. because the shirt. I think I had one like it, but it's probably one like your mom made. You your, buy your the pattern, right? Yeah, came in like a, a package, like paper package, <laughs> yeah. and the pattern was like this brown <laughs> tissue paper. Do you remember that? <laughs> and they laid and, it and out. You laid it out, and, yeah. you, and you pinned it up, and then you cut it, and then you'd sew it. Yeah, yeah. yeah everybody had their own shirts back then. Yeah. I mean. Sad yeah. thing is, I remember that troublemaking face. I was like, yeah, that, that's the face of a troublemaker yeah. right there. <laughs> Nowadays, if you were like making your own clothes like that, you'd be like an entrepreneur, like a hipster. Yeah. You'd be like, oh, man, this guy's so progressive. He makes his own clothes. <laughs> Back then, people used to throw rocks at me. You're like, you loser. Yeah, right. <laughs> your mom makes your clothes. <laughs> I but I had a good joke. birthday. I got a new pellet grill. You, Dude, you lucked out, man. That yeah. is a hell of a grill. I got lucky. I... Uh, because in you know, the last couple of years prior to this, I don't think I got much for my birthday. But when my, my gas grill, I had a uh, what's it, a Weber. And I've had it for like 15 years or not even. No, probably like eight years. And it's a good grill. But, you know, over time, you I've had to re some replace parts, some parts yeah. and stuff. And so I have a nice griddle and I have my gas grill. And, of course, I got a charcoal grill because I like the flavor that charcoal puts on there. But um, You did. You did like that. Yeah. Now. Uh, I, I don't have a smoker. So for years, I used a Bradley smoker, which looks like a little tiny mini fridge. And he takes these hockey puck looking things that are, you know, made of wood, but it looks like hockey pucks. And it works pretty good. You know, they're not real expensive, $400 or so. It's not as good as, you know, an awesome uh, smoker. But yeah. I've had my eye on these pellet grills, and I've had a couple of friends of mine that have had them. And everybody that I've heard of that owns them says, man, they're the best thing. You can grill on them. Mm -hmm. You can smoke on them. You can even bake pies. I don't know why you'd want to bake a pie on a grill, but you can do all this. So I've been looking at them for months and finally my wife was like, well, what do you want for your birthday? And I was like, that's one of the things I've been looking at. She's like, well, do it. That's your birthday gift. So I got that. So I've been, I've been doing a lot of smoking and grilling lately. Uh, and that's what I did pretty much all weekend. Uh, my wife is in Hawaii her cousin, uh, who lives in Australia, is getting married. And so the groom's family, he's Australian, all lives in Australia. And, of course, she lives – all her family lives here in Texas. So they're meeting in the middle in Hawaii. So that's where they're at. So I'm at home alone with all three boys. And I'm telling you, this week has been fantastic. It's been great. <laughs> We've been staying up late, we eat whatever we want. Nobody has to put their laundry up. I mean, it's been perfect. Now, towards the end of the week, we're going to have to go into uh, – critical mode and, and really clean the house up before, before mom, mom gets, gets home. home. But yeah, but it's been great. I mean, I don't know what all the complaining is, but having to stay home with the kids. I mean, it's been pretty much you, pretty you're easy. You're enjoying it? Yeah. In fact, later this week, my mother's leaving town. So I actually have to take care of my dad and all three boys. You and Pop Pop and the Brud. I'm smelling. What day is he coming over? Uh, Sunday. He'll be here Sunday. Oh, I'm going to have to come over. Dude, we're having a Predator Marathon. Oh, it's, you better it's all, believe dude, it. Dude, I'm coming over. Predator, it's happening. I, he's already been hitting me up. He wants to go to the cigar shop. So I was like, yeah, I'll see what we can do. He was asking me on my birthday, and I'm like, you're supposed to get me something, not yeah. the other way around. But yeah. yeah. So I've been looking at you. Oh, God. You almost died. Dude, it was not pleasant. That Tell was a rough one. What happened? I didn't know any of this was going on until I spoke to you on <laughs> Monday, and you sound like you were just steps from death's door. So I had a great weekend. I mean, everything was going good. We all hung out Friday, mm. and we all got together Friday for that buddy of That's ours right. to go back to Italy, to go back to work over there, And uh, which, lucky enough, he survived whatever it was, a spider bite or staff or whatever it was with all the surgeries in his arm. I mean, it was a whole big ordeal. And then Saturday, of course, we were busy Saturday and all that stuff. And then my family went out, uh, went down to Waco Sunday to this cable park down there where it's like they can do like a lazy river and do all this. And all the girls in our big family, they all get together every year and they go down there and it's kind of like a girl's day. You know, they all go yeah, crazy. Yeah. So I was here by myself and uh, was doing some recording and I was actually recorded the show that you're about to hear. 
and uh, which is funny because during this recording is when it's set in. So uh, as I'm doing all my stuff right before I start recording, I realize like, man, I haven't eaten anything. You know, I'm hungry. So uh, I don't really want anything big. So we have like some, you know, there's some grapes and like little slices of like salami or ham or whatever yeah. it is, you know, and like one of those, what are they called? P3s, you know, little kits like that. Yeah. Those little protein, like little yeah. cold cuts in there and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then I, we had a bag of like cube cheese. And so I dumped some cube cheese it's out on cheese my cheese knack, my cheese knack. And I put it out on the plate and I get all my stuff laid out there and I'm looking into at the computer and I'm just popping them in my mouth, just going along, not paying much attention. And after a little bit, I look over and I got like two thirds of everything eaten. And there's a few pieces of cheese left. I've eaten most of the cheese. And uh, like five little cubes, and one of them's got this mold growing on it. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, well, that's at first, because I'm such an idiot. I'm thinking <laughs> here while I'm telling you all this story. I'm like, man, I shouldn't tell this on myself. Uh, my dumb ass is like, huh, well, looks like I dodged a bullet. I didn't eat that one. And I set it to the side, and I pick up another one, and there's fuzz on part of that one. Uh oh. Yeah. So out of the five left, four of them had mold spots on it. And then I'm like, I'm such a dumbass that while I'm just like picking it up with the meat or grabbing it with the, gra I didn't taste it. I'm just eating it and just plugging along. I don't know that you would notice a difference in taste though, really. Well, we've established that I told y'all I don't have any intuition. Like I'm a moron. <laughs> and so I'm just plugging along. Just if we were living a thousand years ago. I'm the guy that would have died real young. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're just going to, I would have either been, been like by that something. dude on 300 where he's cast out. You would have been cast out <laughs> as a child. <laughs> have you seen year one? That'd have been me. Like Jack Black. i would have been yeah. that guy. That'd have been me. I'd have been out trying to hunt something and I'd have been like, pretty sure I got it. And it or like 10,000 BC. <laughs> like we're trying to kill a mammoth and it would have smashed me or something. That's what would have happened. So I start trying to like, well, Maybe that was only the little cluster. That was it. That was the bad. I dodged it all. So I don't know how many bad pieces of cheese I ate. So I got rid of that. I record the show. Well, while I'm recording this episode, you're about to hear. I don't think you can hear my stomach, but it starts making these noises. And long story short, folks, food poisoning sets in Sunday evening. <laughs> And Montezuma shows up and his revenge. The bad thing is, is like the Jim Brewer stand-up special that he talked about that time is the cheese was asked to leave the way it came in. <laughs> and then so it was a violent, very, very violent, like uh, uh, exorcist type week. So pretty much ha uh, what was left of the day Sunday and most of the, the, the night into the wee hours of Monday morning were me just fighting off the, the cold clammy hand of death <laughs> as it set in on me. And then I got so dehydrated. I had my muscle cramps and luckily I know somebody that has IVs and, and does this sort. So I got like IVs on Monday and it, uh, I got taken care of. And so it took me, I didn't eat a solid meal until uh, about 24 hours ago. <laughs> Was Yeah, so it was a lot of fluid. This is the first day I've felt right since Sunday, right now. Well, it's a good cleanse. I mean, every once in a while they talk about doing cleanse. They all talk the, about intermittent that, fasting. That's the first just... thing my smart-ass son said. He's like, hey, Pop, heard you was sick. You get a good cleanse in? I'm like, no, nah, man. I think I pulled a muscle in my rib cage. I mean, it was one of, like, it was been bad. And I, I think I've told you all this before on the show. Uh, about nine, and, nine to ten years ago, what happened to me where I got real violently ill and I was that sick for like three or four days and they finally my wife forced me to go to the doctor because I'm one of those I'll die you know at the house because I'm just an idiot and my wife forced me to go to the doctor and I go and they sent me straight to the hospital and they give me a couple of bags of fluid and uh, they run a bunch of blood tests and they couldn't tell me what it was and they give me all the fluid and I still couldn't go pee I was I mean it was one of those I was too dehydrated right and they were right. afraid like your kidneys are going to shut down dumbass and I'm like oh yeah that's a problem so that was the whole worry now is they gave me the bag and they were like, Hey, look, you'll be peeing in about an hour. That was wrong. I didn't pee till like midday the next day. So I was like, yeah, I probably should have took more. But anyway, it was one of those deals. So this is the first day that I don't feel ran down. I'm actually beginning to feel more like myself. So my wife got mad because I was laying there <laughs> and she's trying to get me to drink a little Gatorade. And she's like, Are, she goes, if you don't get well by Tuesday, I'm, you know, and, and this was that Monday evening and all. She's like, I'm taking you to the hospital. 
And I don't know how many of you have watched Tombstone, but I'm look up at her and I go, I have not yet begun to defile myself. <laughs> and she got so mad. Like she doesn't have a sense. Of, obviously, she cares for me, and I don't know why. Because I'm just like, just it's death. Bring it on. Let's see what happens. But yeah. So yeah. anyway, I, I ended up. I got to show out, but then I've been wiped out, and so we're we're good. Kyle and I are both alive. He's a year older. I'm a few days out of out of yeah. death. So hey, look, we're back. Let's get we're it good. started. We'll get. Let's get it started. Ha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's so get into the news. Me, Check this out. This is uh, posted by Roger Marsh over on MUFON. Recently, a Texas witness in the town of Porter, Texas, which if you don't know where that's at, that's just east of the Woodlands, uh, northeast of Houston area, claims that he saw a boomerang-shaped object with no lights that hovered and moved over his workplace. This, according to testimony case nine four nine six zero. The witness was at work getting ready to leave at approximately 4.20 a.m. And this recently happened. The person says, I was loading up my car close to 4.30 a.m. As I was heading back into the shop to shut off the machines and to turn out the lights, something caught my attention. I saw an aircraft flying by my workplace. It was in the shape of a large V. It had no lights and it didn't make a sound. It was gray in color, a little over a thousand feet in altitude. It looked as if this object didn't want to be seen or was in some type of stealth mode. The only reason I saw it is because the moon was kind of bright that night and reflected off of this object. It came from the north heading south along Loop 494. It wasn't moving very fast. It was just kind of cruising through the sky. Now, the sighting only lasted about 10 seconds, but it felt like five minutes. After it flew out of my sight, I, it really sunk in what I saw, and I started shaking. So, I rushed back into the shop. I was scared, and I have to admit, kind of freaked out by what I saw. So, I waited for about 20 minutes to summon up the courage to go back outside to get into my car and leave. This is something... I will never forget. So, you know, this is, man, I don't know what it is, but, you know, we've talked about the UFOs changing shape over yes. the ages, you know, and this seems to be the latest manifestation of the UFOs as people are reporting these giant things. It looks like a V or a Chevron. You know, that was what was reported over Stephenville. Yep. That's what it reported in, in dozens of places. And this is a common thing where people see it at night, no lights on, making no sound. So if it's not extraterrestrial, it does make sense that if they're going to be testing secret aircraft like this, you'd be doing it at night because what's the chance of somebody's going to see it? They it's person, ours, man. It's It's got to be our stuff. This this Chevron business is our stuff. I think so. I mean, maybe, and, you know, people report um, that the oftentimes these Chevron, these V-shaped things, that they see orbs coming out of it, like the Chevron is actually the mothership. Yeah. Uh, the, the person... Talks about it was at about a thousand feet in altitude. They don't really talk about how big it was, though. So yeah, that's true. I don't know. Is it something that's not that large, but it's kind of close? I don't know. I don't know what they're saying. But anyways, another sighting of this Chevron-shaped UFO, dude. I here in Texas. It, I, I love these ideas of this. I'm just wondering if it's the reason that they're Chevron-shaped. If it, is it because it, is it easy for us to build? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's I like, don't know. Because I, I keep going back to like uh, Bob Lazar. Yeah. He yeah. talks about the shapes and he was like, they're not all say the same shape. But I'm like, maybe that shape of what they have found isn't easy for us to build. But that is something that we just, maybe whatever it is, we've got the, the engine built and we already have that shape. So it's just like having a, a custom built engine. That you just put in a, a car you already have there. Right. You just retrofit it. So we just like retrofit that motor into that into that spacecraft and let's try it out and see what happens. Yeah, I don't know. But, uh, you know, like that's one of the arguments that you always make with the UFO sightings is why would they need to put lights on them? Well, in this case and so many other cases, there are no lights on Yeah, them. yeah. So maybe it is extraterrestrial. Oh, nah, yeah. they just learned. They just they, Somebody was listening and they were like, yeah, take the lights off. Or maybe they just had them turned off. <laughs> yeah, maybe. They just weren't running them. I've got you something here that I think everybody loves. I know I do. Uh, from Cryptozoology News, folks. An extinct prehistoric bird was spotted in Arizona. Mm. A 38-year-old woman in Maricopa County says that she saw a bird that believed to have come from an uh, extinct three million years ago. 
Okay. Okay. Now, apparently this woman is an avid bird watcher that wants to remain anonymous, but she told Cryptozoology News that she was driving home and she spotted this bird uh, around noon o'clock on a Friday. This is just a couple weeks ago. She said, I was driving north on a six lane road. And I was now it says here that the location was omitted for privacy reasons. It's in a research, isn't aren't they called orinthologists or something I think like that? that is, yeah. In an ornithologist? Something like that. Yeah. And it says that I was coming from the grocery store and I saw an extremely large bird flying very low. It was on the same side of the road, but going in the opposite direction of traffic heading south. And you ready for this, Philly? Yeah. The wingspan took up three lanes of the traffic. Wow. Yeah. She said that it had over 20 feet. Now, she says the bird was a brownish gray color. It was light colored. I am a bird lover and often go into nature with my binoculars to explore for the birds. I love them. And I know what cranes and eagles and auks all look like. And this resembled a crane, but with a longer neck. And the wings were massive. And it was flying so low, I was concerned it could fly into a car. But it just kept soaring. Shout out to Daddy Long Neck. I like that guy. Right? <laughs> And she added that she didn't have enough time to grab her phone to take pictures and that she couldn't just stop in the middle of the lane. Now, she goes, in retrospective, though, I wish I'd have just done a U-turn and followed it. I regret not thinking of that at the time. Now, she goes on to say that the bird definitely looked out of place and that after looking it up online, it very much looked like, and I wish Luke was here to tell me what this was, Olin, Olgen scene dinosaur I guess, like, not the Paleocene, but the <laughs> Olgecene dinosaur. My guess is as good as yours. But uh, Paleogonus sanderisi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She said, it looked and felt like it was prehistoric. And when I found the illustrations of that bird, it looked almost exactly like it. So once again, these are exciting. Like, when people see these things, I put them in two categories. One yeah. is a dinosaur. They see, like, a pterosaur, a pteranodon, or they see giant birds. In this case, this person is an avid bird watcher. She doesn't mention that it looked like a pterodactyl. She's saying it looks like a bird with feathers and everything else, but just huge. Something that's supposed to be extinct, not extant. Right. And so, you know, if we always talk about when people have these sightings, you trust pilots more or cops or people that are trained observers. This woman's a trained observer. Yeah. And she saw a giant bird. She's familiar with cranes and herons, and that's not what she saw. Yeah. So what the heck? A thunderbird? What is it? Well, you Arizona. nailed it. You nailed it, though. Is she's like, she knows what she's looking at. Yeah. And she's like, and then she picks it out. And you don't make that mistake. And why are these thunderbirds always seen in like areas like the desert, like in Big Bend area, Texas? This was in Arizona. I mean. The veil's thin there, my friend. The I don't veil know. is thin. And speaking of thin veils, we're going to take a quick break. And we come back, I'm going to be discussing some stuff about the Kraken, the history of behind the idea of the Kraken and then some other strange stories that link into some sea monster type stuff that I think you're really going to enjoy. Let's jump over there real quick. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. Faintest sunlights flee about his shadowy sides. Above him swell huge sponges of millennial growth and height, and far away into the sickly light. From many a wondrous grot and secret cell unnumbered, an enormous polypi. Winnow with giant arms the slumbering green. There hath he lain for ages and will lie battening upon huge sea worms in his sleep until the latter fire shall heat the deep. Then once by man and angels to be seen, in roaring he shall rise and on the surface die. The Kraken by Alfred Lloyd Tinson in 1830, y'all. That's what we're going to be chit-chatting about today is some crazy sea monster stories. If you love crazy sea monster stories, we all know Kyle does, and we all know that I don't like the sea, so this is especially unnerving for little old me. I think I'm a poet now. Check me out. Uh, 
I would like to tell y'all, I always have like a background story of what got me started down on this. And there's another one to this. Uh, it's my, my troublesome wife and how much she loves Shark Week and loves giving me a hard time. And all of you listening, how much y'all love sending me the links and all these things to these crazy creatures we find in our oceans. And I do enjoy it. It's like I said, I love the ocean as long as I'm on top, as long as I'm not in it, you know, which is like, I'm sure the lobster loves the steam as long as he's not in the pot. You know, it's one of those things like, oh yeah, this is nice. As long as I'm not being cooked and eaten. But so there were, what ended up happening and, and I'm going to get into it in the story, but there were some things that led to me thinking about this while sitting there watching it the last few weeks of of different episodes that she'd wanted me to watch and her and I sat together and checked out and then me going on a little further. And there's a lot of different things that popped up. So I guess to get started, it's going to have to be something like this. You could only imagine what it must've been like. And we always go back to this, what it must've been like. You can only imagine what it truly must have been like to be a sailor back in those days, back in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s. I mean, as far back as you want to go. But imagine you didn't have the ability or we didn't, you know, at the time to really study the depths of the ocean, to really know what was down there. So it was only left up to chroniclers and ship's captains and and ship logs and things that would document what was seen. So anything out of the ordinary that they had never seen before, a a captain and crew had never seen before, would probably take on some sort of mythological meaning or or angle to it whenever it was told in a story. And it's it's easier for scientists of the time and, uh, you know, the overwhelming group of academics for the time, just like today, to dismiss a lot of this. Of course, it's probably easier to dismiss today because of what we do know. But back then, you know, it was also one of those things, well, we don't have, you know, we need, you know, we need to get a, a specimen if we're going to prove these things. But some of these stories that we we had passed down to us that end up becoming, and, and we end up finding the root of the story, it always makes you think about the other stories. And that's why I wanted to start it off with the story of the Kraken. Uh, the tales of the Kraken, about how it was a gigantic beast, known to attack ships, known to try to kill its crew. Centuries of these stories, hundreds of years of these stories about monsters in the sea. And the Kraken seems to be the one that, I remember the stories of the Kraken from the the original Clash of the Titans. And it was nothing like what as I got older and you start reading about the Kraken that you find out. But in that, you know, as that story, it was a great monstrous creature. It looked like it should have been in a Godzilla film, right? And you would think that there was more to it. And there is. There is more to it. Now, there is a manuscript that some people have dug and found and went deep researching this. And this manuscript came from around 1180 from a, a king of Norway named Sphere. And it was in there that the, it was even written about sightings of this this kraken. And these things were talked about that they believed that they were and, and had encounters with that were this creature was capable of sinking ships. And this all took place, like I said, in Norway. You have to imagine between Greenland and Iceland and you know, in, in their seas. And when we think of ships, we, we can't think of the ships like we think of a cruise ship today or even the giant. I don't know why it goes back to like the, the British Royal Navy when you think of the giant sailing vessels that they had, very large. Uh, if you look back, even go back as far as the 1100s, 1200s, you look at what they had as ships especially for like a, a Viking, a Nordic era ship. They weren't, they were large, but they weren't the kind of Royal Navy large that we have. So the size of one that would take to take down a ship of that size isn't what you would reflect in some of the paintings and the drawings when it shows a giant like pirate ship or, you know, a one that's got a giant mast and is a three sailed ship as it's being drugged to the bottom of the ocean by this giant creature. It may not have really been that size of ship. So you have to you have to kind of think along those lines is when the story started, the ships were smaller. The creature could have still been huge, but it it's all on scale. The creature wouldn't have to be a 500-foot monster to take it down, where maybe it was a 60-foot creature that could have taken down a, 
a, a ship of some sort. And maybe it wasn't a ship. You know, we can go back and forth. There's a lot of Nordic writings in old uh, Icelandic history all the way back to like the 13th century that talk about these things. And they even have a name like uh, Hafgufa, which was like a sea mist, or Lanbakar, which is a, a they called heatherback. And I don't know if heatherback meant, I'm not really sure. Maybe it was meant to be leatherback. I'm not sure. Like we said, you go back, but you can keep going back in. And there was a lot of Nordic tradition and, and Nordic writings and books of things that were jotted down uh, that give these stories of that, that make you believe that it was almost, almost easily spotted or almost more well known than it is today. Like when someone mentions a wolf, we all have an idea what a wolf is. And you can imagine living in this time back then and reading these books and this being part of your folklore is when someone mentioned a kraken. Maybe not by that name, but the half goofa. If somebody mentioned that, you would instantly know what it looked like because you were like, oh, when I was a child of 12, I saw one, you know, and, and we were fishing with my uncle and when we all encountered this thing. Now, what's funny is when I was speaking of scale is some of these encounters you go back, talk about, and this is in Nordic mythology, talk about them being the size of an island or even the size of a mountain when it would take down their ships and take, you know, drag the crew to the abyss. So the idea of a, of a sea creature being in the ocean, the size of an Island, we're not saying it can't happen, but I mean, the odds of it happening is <laughs> probably slim and none. I mean, when we all know for the most part, I mean, like, what are we even talking about? When we've discussed a Megalodon shark, a Megalodon shark would have been the largest thing in the ocean uh, of recent time. And it's not near as big as an island, but I mean, I guess that's all relative. I mean, I'm sure there's some islands out there that aren't much bigger than 3,000 square foot. So, I mean, there's little just knobs sticking up in the ocean at different points. And you could, yeah, I mean, by theory or by definition, it's an island. So, I mean, there's ways of splitting hairs and getting around things and all this. And, you know, it's like, and it leaves no survivors. We're like, well, then how did the story get out if it left no survivors? So you've, you've got to look at the, the folklore like we've all discussed on this show and like you all appreciate, you look at the folklore and somewhere in between is probably the, the truth in there. But I guess nothing really cemented the idea of the Kraken in, in history until around the first modern scientific surveys that were done by Europe in the 18th century. And that's kind of when they started really investigating the natural world, really digging into it. And you talk about a fellow named Carl Linnaeus, and he's known as the father of modern biological classification. And even in the book, he wrote a book called Systema Naturae, and that was written in 1735. He included the kraken amongst cephalopods and mollusks in his book. So I tell you all this to get into a story as we start going down the, the the rabbit hole, this story was written by, uh, I say the story, it's not really a story. It is more of a historical account of a fellow that was more involved in the, uh, I guess you could say the, the history before he realized, <laughs> before he realized that he was that involved, he was truly involved with the history of the giant squid. Now, this story was was or this written this, this whole article was written by a uh, a fellow cryptozoologist and man fascinated with this, and the director of the Center for Fortean Zoology, a man that named John or Jonathan Downs, and Jonathan has done amazing work and is a, a, a great guy. We've spoken to Nick multiple times about him, and he has really dug deep on a lot of this and and. He included this one time when he wrote an article, and I'm going to read you some of this. And it, it, it's about a fella named uh, Pierre Dene de Montfort, or Montfort. Pierre Montfort. Uh, in 1820, this fella dies of starvation, which is horrible, in a Parisian gutter in the cold. At the time, he was given a pauper's burial. He had no money. 
No one he knew. There was a very few people that even attended his funeral when they found out about it. And a few that were there laughed at him after he was placed in the ground. They giggled, snickered behind his back and at his funeral nonetheless, because they believed that he had thrown away his life in search of sea monsters. Now, Pierre was a French zoologist. And as you'll see, had he lived into the 1850s, he would have been proven correct. See, he was, and I never even knew this was a thing, a malacologist, which is an expert in mollusks. I can't imagine going to school to become an expert in mollusks, but he did. And he was also what many considered a scientific heretic because he researched things that his peers believed were just what we're told when we start looking into stories of Bigfoot or Mothman or flying humanoids is it's just a, a tale. It's folklore. It means nothing. But what Pierre was fascinated with were the stories of giant cephalopods. Now you got to go back to the fact that Pierre was born in 1764 and from the jump, he was a nature junkie, loved it. And of course, around that time, it was around the time of the, of the French revolution. And there were a lot of very uh, intelligent scientists that were, I guess you could say prosecuted, were not needed during the French revolution. A bunch of them met the, met their fate, you know, at the end of a gun or the end of a noose or the end of a blade. And so there were several that they lost to the French revolution, but he didn't, he went through it. He served in the army for a bit and, then he was uh, worked with as a uh, uh, an assistant to a geologist there in in France, the last name of Saint Fond, and then he became an assistant to a, a fellow named Jardine de Plantis, and uh, that was there, or not that's the name of the place, but not a fellow. I'm sorry, but it's the name of a place called Jardines de Plantis, and it is a botanical garden in Paris, and so he was there for quite a bit, and during the time, you know, he was offered different expeditions would you like to go on? So while he was still, you know, kind of tied to that place, he would go on these expeditions and he'd gone to Germany, was studying geology in Germany. He got to go to Egypt back then. He got to go study all that in Egypt that they had known at the time. And apparently he was a very good linguist. And so he, people used him as a translator and he got so good at it that the museum of natural history hired him. And, was he was even almost given a chair in mineralogy uh, at the the museum. So it was one of those things that he missed his glory in his lifetime by mere inches, almost everywhere he went. And it was almost fortuitous that it would turn out and his life turned out the way it did. He wrote books. He, he helped, uh, he say he helped. He was a, contributor to many books and a lot of studies and uh, he helped you know study a lot of on mollusks a lot of plants he he got big into anything natural that he could get into but somewhere along the lines he found out about ambergris which is you've probably all it, it goes into cologne and perfume it's what whales cough up they look like a owl poop and it's the only way you can get it of course is through there and what it was is he started studying what whales coughed up and found out that when they would wash ashore and what these things had vomited up these sperm whales that they were beaks undigested beaks and claws of cephalopods in these sperm whales ambergris so he got to looking at these things and he got to looking at some of the the species or the little study parts of, of some of the other cephalopods that they had. And he realized that like some of these are way bigger than what's on the ones that we have, these specimens. So that's kind of where he was like, wait a second. If that beak comes off of that creature and the one I have is a few millimeters long and the one this thing coughed up is hundreds of millimeters long or whatever, you know, like you would freak out. So what do you do to find these things out? So you have to go talk to people that deal with whales. So that's what Pierre did. So Pierre heads down and finds some American whalers that had settled along the coast in France. 
And so he sits down and starts interviewing these whalers, trying to find evidence to see what they had seen and see if they could point him in any direction of what he was thinking that might be out there was true. Well, he found a fellow named an American fellow named Ben Johnson. And Ben told him a story that when they had killed a sperm whale, that in the mouth of the sperm whale that they had found a monstrous tentacle. Now, Ben said that this tentacle was 35 feet long and it had been severed at both ends. So that was the middle section of a tentacle and it was 35 feet long. Now, of course, Pierre said, well, you know, maybe there's 10 to 20 foot of it was lost. Now, Ben goes on to tell him that it was thick as the mast on their ship and that the suction cups on this tentacle were the size of hats. Well, there was another fellow he spoke to, the last name of Reynolds. And Reynolds said that he saw something that at the time he was thought it was a red sea serpent laying next to a whale that they had killed. And when they got it up to the ship, they realized at that time that it was a massive tentacle around 45 feet long. And he says that the, the, suck, the suckers, the suction pads on that tentacle were the size of a dinner plate. So Pierre starts talking to these guys and these, all these other dudes coming forward starts telling him what they've seen. So he starts writing about this and he classifies, Pierre's the man that classifies these two giant cephalopods. He's classified the first as the colossal octopus and the second, the kraken octopus. And the kraken would go on to be known as the giant squid, Architeuthis. So he goes through and he starts writing and then he starts talking about a painting that he had seen. And he saw this painting in the chapel of St. Thomas in Brittany. And he says that this painting showed this giant octopus attacking a ship and that allegedly that this painting was based on real events that had happened when it had been anchored off Angola. So this giant octopus, uh, the story goes, uh, attacked a ship, wrapped its tentacles around the rigging of the ship, pulled it. It caused it to list to the side. Uh, the crew at the time on the ship with their swords uh, managed to cut the tentacles enough to, by cutting them off to get it to release the ship so it could go back upright before it took on so much water it sank. And the painting was apparently done to commemorate all this because the story goes that the, the sailors had been praying at the time to St. Thomas. So you go through all this, and there's a lot of books written about these creatures that he had seen and, and that these people had had come across. And, and there's all of these stories that you're going to start getting into. And then he starts talking to some natives and he starts talking to natives, talk about a, uh, a giant, the Ambazobi, and that it would attack their boats and it would drag their canoes to the bottom and that they believed that it was simply an evil spirit. And that it was, that was the people of Angola believed this. The Bay Congo people believed that this was a, a thing of bad spirits. Now, there was a, a ship captain named Jean Magnus Dens, and he was Danish. And he had worked for the Gottenberg Company, and he had retired to Dunkirk. And he told a story that happened off the coast of West Africa. And he said that at the time, everything was calm and cool, and he took the time to scrape some barnacles off the ship. So he lowers some guys over there sitting on the planks like you always see in the old school, scraping there, working along there. The story goes with him that in the middle of working, and, and you have to imagine, I'm sure it would be like a feeding frenzy. You get multiple men hanging off the side of a ship, scraping an old ship, barnacles falling. There's going to be fish everywhere. It's going to draw the attention of other animals. The story he told that everything was cool, the water was calm, and all of a sudden a giant cephalopod rose out of the water, wrapped its tentacles around two men, and dragged them underwater. It wrapped its arm around a third man, but he was holding on, and the shipmates there managed to save that fellow, but they cut off that the, the, the Kraken's, if you will, they cut off his tentacle, and so they saved that fella. Story goes that he died of shock later, and they said that the portion that was severed was 25 feet long, and that they believe that the whole arm that had been wrapped working, trying to get him, had been 30 to 40 foot long. So the other two men that were wrapped up by this thing, uh-uh, they didn't get them back. He was gone. 
Now, the captain goes on to say that he believes that if this creature would have got all of its tentacles wrapped up into the ship, that it could have easily have capsized it. See, now that's another thing that if you notice the story is going is when you think about this, at least I do, you think about it pulling it straight under. Well, imagine it would be, you know, the the power it would take to pull a ship straight down is almost unmeasurable, you know, for an animal. So imagine, if you will, if it got its tentacles all on one side, the weight, and maybe even, let's just say, got it around the mast, caused it to list like the one they portrayed in the painting, then it goes under. So you go through all this, and you start looking into where he keeps going on. Pierre keeps diving into these stuffs and looking, and he says that at one point that, that he's finding more and more people talking about ships go missing because of cephalopods, and that there was even 10 ships there was a disappearance of 10 ships in 1782 that they believed that they could rack up at this one point in time that had been because of a giant squid. So you go through all these things, and 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 he starts doing more and more work. Now, you come to find out he did a little more. He said that some were believed to be due to the Kraken. Some were be believed to be lost in a hurricane that he actually found out. But as you start looking, some guys tricked him. Some guys, because he wanted it so bad, some a few may have tricked him. And because of that, they believe that some of these guys tricking him were put up by some of his scientific brothers that didn't like what he was doing, that thought he was wasting his time. So this goes on, and so he starts getting besmirched, and people start laughing. People find out, and... Now he can't get work uh, because of his ideas, and they pretty much blacklist him. And so he can't work. No scientific group will hire him. So all of the study, all of the work, everything he'd done before, because he had these outlandish ideas and some things he couldn't put his finger on, they just laughed him completely out of work. So he actually went, basically took his money, bought him a place, in the country and started writing books and he became a beekeeper had an apiary then he wrote books on linguistics and he just i mean made very very meager means uh if they were collectors that needed something appraised or identified they would you know he would go and do that for very little money and because of that he plunged into depression and became an alcoholic and wouldn't take care of himself and pretty much literally withered away until, like we discussed, he was found dead of starvation in a cold, dirty gutter in 1820 and was forgotten. Nobody talked about him. Nothing happened. Uh, that was pretty much where everything went. It was just like, uh, now what's funny is even though he's created 25 genre that they still use today, uh, I say genre, you know, the genus that they use, he's really not spoken about. They just kind of left it all, fall to the side, and that was it. Uh, again, though, later on, like we said, if he'd have just made it about 35 to 40 more years, he'd have been proven right because some parts – start showing up, start washing up, and some sailors start carrying them in and start handing them to scientists. And there are some Danish zoologists that get a hold of them, and they start checking it out. And there was a professor, uh, Steenstrup, published the first scientific description of a giant squid. But Pierre Montfort was given hardly any, if any, credit no matter all the information that he amassed for this whole thing. And so, like I said, if he'd have just lived to be in the 50s, because in 1853, that's where Steenstrup found a giant cephalopod that washed up on a Danish beach. And there he recovered the beak, and he used it scientifically, and that's where he was given the name Architeuthis ducks. And so, again, this all goes back to Pierre. And that's when it, this creature, it wasn't until then, officially became entered into science. 
And then that's when the Kraken idea officially returned to be maybe more than just a myth. So Pierre was forgotten about by most, if not everyone. So you fast forward where these things wash up all this. In 2012, there was a group of scientists from Japan's National Science Museum, and they brought some public television broadcasters and whatnot, and of course the Discovery Channel, and they filmed for the first time a giant squid in its natural habitat. Now, the species itself they know was first recorded live in 2006, and that's whenever, and you can go find those videos on YouTube, there was a Japanese vessel and uh, off the uh, Agaswara Islands, and they were trying to hook the giant squid, so they dropped the bait down below, had the camera on it, and that's when the team pulls up a 7-meter or 24-foot squid. They bring that thing up and bring it up on top of the, the water, and you can see it, and everybody got to do it, right? Now, this wasn't the monsters that people have been talked about. Uh, finding a live giant squid is extremely rare. Most all of them wash up on beaches or deep sea trawlers, the Japanese trawlers. Sometimes you'll be able to look them up online. You'll see pictures of uh, research vessels and trawlers would have them laid upon their, their deck and you'll see them stretched out and laid out. But lots of times by the time they get up there, things have pulled off, tentacles have pulled off, uh, parts have fallen off of them. Even when they wash ashore, like we all know, and we've discussed with certain creatures, the sea does crazy things to them. Things uh, slip and slough and bloat, and it can alter what their actual appearance looks like. So science gets involved, and they figure out a new method, and they want to try to find out how big a, a squid can truly get. So they start using its beak size to estimate its body length, and they have a scientific calculation for that. And so they were talking at one point that they believed that a giant squid could not get more than maybe 30 foot for the longest time considering the beaks that were found in the stomachs of sperm whales. But now based upon this new scientific method that they've come up with a few years ago, that they believe now that they could reach up to 66 feet or 20 meters long, larger than the colossal squid and larger than anything ever been documented that they've, they've never documented this and using that. Now that's just a belief. They just, in air quotes, we believe it can reach up to 66 feet. They're not saying that's as big as it could ever get. They just know that it could reach links up too, which maybe we don't know. There's so much we don't know. And why I get to that is why I get to this, the great white shark. If any of you watched Shark Week, then you watched an episode about Deep Blue. Now, great white sharks, uh, they have what's referred to in scientific terms is sexual dimorphism, and which means the females are larger than the males. So when you look at a male great white, you're going to look between 10 to 13 foot, somewhere right around in there, where females, on a, these are average sizes, are about 16 foot, you know, 14 to 16, just a, you know, a little bit bigger. Now they have been monstrous females weighed They've had been, you know, where they verify the links to them. Like one, they, they've they've got one that they know for a fact was twenty foot long, and when you start talking about a twenty footer, you start talking about massive weights, massive weights, uh, for over four thousand pounds. When you start getting into these things, now there's older tales of giant great whites caught, but science, like everything else, they, they're not willing to comment. They're not willing to go all in on those because they weren't there, of course, to to do the, the research themselves. Uh, there's some stories that you can go all the way back to one that was caught in 1870 in Australia, I believe is where it was, uh, in the southern part of Australia that they said was a 37 foot long or 36 foot long, 36 foot long, I believe. Uh, great white. Uh, there was one in the 30s, I believe, that was a 36 to 37 foot long in the 1930s that was in Canada where they said that they caught a shark there. Uh, I don't know if it was a great white, you know, you don't, you don't really get to see that, but, uh, they just say a shark, but they, they do know for a fact, the 1870s shark was a great white shark in Australia, but they say that of course, you know, these measurements were never really scientifically scrutinized and there was no scientist there 
to really see him. So they may not have really been that size, but I bring up deep blue because like I said, the average female is 16 foot deep blue, which was spotted a few years ago. Uh, she's 22 feet. And if you watch the newest episode where they are looking again for deep blue, and if you go online and search deep blue, she appeared in Hawaii, like 3000 miles from where she was originally seen. And she's feasting on a dead shark or maybe a dead, a dead whale rather she was seen in the Galapagos down at the the bottom. Is it Galapagos? No, the Guadalupe. She was seen down there at at the bottom. There's there's like a deep trench the way this thing runs. And if you watch where they were filming this, uh, there's a lot of big sharks down there. And they were learning more as the deeper you go, the great whites get bigger. And they believe now that the large great whites feed on the smaller great whites. And all this comes from the fact that they lost a shark, that they had a shark tagged. And this has always been said that it started dropping, its body temperature dropped to the inside temperature or the stomach temperature of a great white, that it may have actually been consumed by a larger great white, the tracking device. And when then it was finally expelled, the tracking device washed up and they could get the information from it. So scientists are now getting an idea on things of something that we've known about forever, but we're just now seeing that we've learned something new. Oh, the larger great whites may feed on the smaller great whites. So that means that there may be monstrous great whites the deeper you go. So given that, that brings me back to Bernard Hevelman. And he was a monster in the uh, cryptozoology realm. And he actually has a system for categorizing sea serpents and sea creatures. And I want to talk about that system because there's one of them in here that I want to discuss. Now, Bernard examined 587 sightings he looked through, and these sightings took place from 1639 to 1966. And from what he broke down with all of those sightings, that there's at least, at least, y'all, nine different types of unknown animals involved in these sightings. The first would be the long neck seal, or long neck. And he says it's a mammal with a long slender neck similar to that of lake monsters. Now he goes on and he talks about that. This is when people say that it may be a living uh, plesiosaur. He talks about the multi humped sea serpent where it looks like it has a string of humps along its back, which we've heard about Loch Ness. Some claim it looks like that. Some even say it was a plesiosaur. He also brings up the multi finned sea serpent, which he says is an armored mammal with lateral fin-like projections along both sides of its body. And he has more where he goes into what these creatures could actually be. Uh, other people speculate that this multi fin sea serpent is some type of crustacean, like a giant crustacean. Now, here's an awesome one, and uh, Carl Shooker even talks about this, but it's the super otter, which is a rough-skinned mammal with a distinct head and tapering tail. Then they go into where they talk about the marine saurian, which is like a marine crocodile. They talk about the super eel, which contains two different kinds of serpentine fish, y'all. Imagine a giant eel, like those things aren't creepy enough. And then he has what's called the father of all turtles, which is like a giant turtle. And then he has something very interesting, the yellow belly, which is a yard, a, a yard, <laughs> a large yellow tadpole shaped animal. So that's something that he talks about too. But my favorite, that he talks about is simply because of the name, y'all, and it is the mare horse, like a mermaid, the mer horse. He says it's a mammal with a horse-like head and large eyes. Now some, he goes on to say, have suggested that this may also be a plesiosaur. But it's also known in cryptozoological circles as the main monster, the, this mer horse. And they said that you can identify it by its bright red mane and flashing green eyes. It's also known as the mare horse or faxi. Now, this is something that comes from Iceland because they say it can be spotted in the fjords of Iceland. And some people have gone on to say and, and talk about it when they research it, that they, they believe that some of that comes from dragons portrayed from uh, traders uh, from China. Like they've seen paintings and, and, and drawings of the Chinese dragon. And it's kind of something that's rolled together. But either way, 
it looks some sort of water dragon or water horse. And they believe it. it, And now look, it's even been linked to, of course, destroying boats and killing the crew. So uh, they believe that this thing was a real monster. Now, again, like we've said before, could it be something that was misidentified? Could it be something that attacked a ship and maybe they didn't see it real clearly? You don't really know. I would think if you saw something attacking a ship for some time that you were on, and of course back then it's not like you could just jump on a safety vessel or bring a helicopter out or anything like that, so you had to ride this thing out, I would believe that you would get a pretty good look at it. But in uh, San Clemente, Southern California, San Clemente, at one time was believed to be a haven for monster sea creatures. In 1934, in the June issue of Esquire magazine, there was an article written by a fellow named Ralph Bandini, and he wrote about his two encounters with the San Clemente monster. And in his article, the article was titled, I Saw a Sea Monster. Bandini wrote this, San Clemente Island is a lonely, windswept bit of rock and sand lying some 50 miles south of Los Angeles Harbor. It is little frequented except by fishermen. Its waters are lonely too. The thing itself appears to like this remote bit of ocean, the windy channel between San Clemente and Santa Catalina. Now, during the 1900s, there were rumors that a strange creature was roaming these waters and that around 30 people had seen this thing, but nobody was willing to really come forward and tell them, tell people about this. So Baldini decides, you know what? I'm going to go do a little fishing. I love to fish. I mean, who don't, right? But he's going to go do some tuna fishing down there in Southern California. And he claims that while doing this tuna fishing, that's when he first spotted this thing. He says in his tale that he was 10 miles off the coast of Catalina when this creature emerged from the water a mile away from him. Now, he said, look, this wasn't a whale. This was this is nothing that we would know what it was. He said this thing was a monster. And he said, of course, it was shiny because the water glistening off of its body and that it rose out of the water. He said it exposed itself for maybe a minute or so and then sank back in. Well, at that time, he chose not to speak about it. Now, he knew it could make him some money and it could bring some publicity to publicity. Yeah, that's what it sounds like, folks, when you have a stroke mid sentence publicity to uh, his writings. Right. So he's like, OK, I'm going to do exactly what all the other people did. I'm just going to keep my mouth closed till I can talk to them. So he starts tracking down some of these people and he starts having them draw what they've seen. And then he takes it and he goes to the next person without showing them. And he's like, hey, can you tell me what you saw? Can you sketch it? And they sketch it. And he goes to as many as he can get to to do this. And when he's done, all the sketches look the same and they all match what he saw. So you jump forward. September 1920, he has another encounter. This time he's sword fishing with his buddy named Mr. Smith Warren. And they had been in Mosquito Harbor. So they were passing White Rock when something caught his, you know, Baldini's eye. And he's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on. What the hell is that now? And you imagine he's probably not told his buddies. He's just playing it cool. But he's always watching at this point now, right? Now, he said what he saw was only 300 yards away. And he said it was barrel shaped. Said it was tapering toward the top. And he said it had a reptilian head that resembled those of huge prehistoric creatures whose reproductions stand in various museums. And he said it lifted out of the water what had to have been a good 20 feet. He said, now its eyes were widely spaced. And he said, I have never even thought of something like this. Not even in nightmares could you dream up of what this thing was. He said, these eyes were about a foot in diameter. He said, they looked like dinner plates. And then he goes on to talk about it. It looked like something that H.P. Lovecraft would have written. He said, except this was real. So his buddy fires up the engine and starts heading towards it, right? Yeah. They head towards the creature. He said, we get to within about 100 foot of it, and it appeared to be covered in what had mane. He said it had a reddish hue, and the hair was coarse, kind of like bristly hair, but very coarse. 
He said, at the time, all that was sticking out of the water was the neck and head. He goes, so I don't know what the length and the mass of this creature was below the waves because around the, you know, the neck and head, he said the, the water was churning from where you could tell this thing was, you know, actually motoring along under the water. He said it rolled and went down. That was it. So there's only a few, right, that would come forward and talk about this thing. And apparently there's only a few still, some have even claimed today that, that they've seen something like this. But there's not a lot of people came through. So I don't know if there was a small window of sightings or what it was that was going on at this time. But apparently there was a handful of folks saw it. They all got together because of Baldini. And after speaking to all of them and getting their stories, when he piled them all together, he's like, hey, guess what? This thing must have been a legit creature. So you now you jump back into uh, northern peoples. Uh, the history of northern peoples was written by uh, a Swedish writer named uh, Magnus Marina, and it was all of, this was written back in 1555, and it was all about Norwegian sea serpents. And in that book, he gives a story like this. It says, "Those who sail up along the coast of Norway to trade or to fish." all tell the remarkable story of how a serpent of fearsome size, 200 feet long, 20 foot wide, resides in the rifts and caves outside of Bergen. It goes on to say that one bright summer night, this serpent leaves the caves to eat calves, lambs, and pigs, or it fares out to the sea and feeds on octopus and jellyfish, crabs, and similar marine animals. It has a long hair, eel-like, hanging from its neck, sharp black scales and flaming red eyes. It attacks vessels, grabs and swallows people as it lifts itself up like a column from the water. Yeah. So there's another sighting of something like this that happened back on the 12th of December in 1857. A Castellan ship bound from Bombay to Liverpool was about 10 miles from St. Helena. And this is what it said that a monster suddenly appeared and there was three chief officers on that ship, Captain G.H. Harrington, Mr. W. Davies, and Mr. E. Wheeler. And this description was entered in the captain's official meteorological journal and then was given to the Board of Trade. And it says that nothing can be more plain than the honest good faith in which the narrative is written. All right, now this is what the chief writes. It's the captain's own words. And here's a quote from the book. It says, While myself and officers were standing on the lee side of the poop, looking towards the island, we were startled by the sight of a huge marine animal, which reared its head out of the water within 20 yards of the ship, when it suddenly disappeared for about half a minute and then made its appearance in the same manner again. Showing us distinctly its neck and head and about 10 or 12 feet out of the water, its head was shaped like a long nun buoy, which is a, it's like a cone shaped buoy that they used. And it says that I suppose the diameter to have been seven or eight feet in the largest part with a kind of scroll or tuft of loose skin encircling it about two feet from the top. The mane in this case was recognized as a continuous frill of skin and it turned over hanging down two feet from the top or the median line of the spine. The water was discolored for several hundred feet from its head, so much so that on its first appearance, my impression was that the ship was in broken water produced, as I supposed, by some volcanic agency since the last time I passed the island. But the second appearance completely dispelled those fears and assured us that it was a monster of extraordinary length which appeared to be moving slowly towards the land. The ship was going too fast to enable us to reach the masthead in time to form a a correct estimate of the extreme length. But from what we saw from the deck, we conclude that it must have been over 200 feet long. The boat swing and several of the crew who observed it from the top gallant forecastle state that it was more than double the length of the ship in which case it must have been 500 feet. But that as it may, I am convinced that it belonged to the serpent tribe. It was of a dark color about the head and was covered with several white spots. This is written by Captain 
Harrington. And then, of course, the other men of the crew, all being chief officers, backed up exactly what he had written. So, not like the Kraken, not like the Great White Shark, but this merhorse or whatnot that they had seen, possibly 500 foot in length. So to wrap this story up, to give you all the idea of maybe there are still giant creatures out there, but to wrap this story up, I need to leave you all with this, just a reminder. That on December 22nd of 1938, Marjorie Latimer, a museum curator in East London, South Africa, was paying a visit to the docks. This was part of her normal job. Her job duty was that she would go out and inspect any of the catches by local fishermen that she thought would or that they thought were out of the ordinary. And so she's digging through them, doing her daily ritual, and in a pile of fish, she spotted a fin. And she recalled this, and she wrote this down, and all this was even talked about. She said, I picked away at a layer of slime to reveal the most beautiful fish I'd ever seen. It was a pale mauve blue with faint flecks of whitish spots. It had an iridescent silver blue-green sheen all over it. It was covered in hard scales. It had four limb-like fins and a strange puppy dog tail. So she had her assistant help her. They tried to convince the taxi driver, and they put a 127-pound dead fish in the back of his car, and they hauled it back to the museum, folks. And there she laid it on the table, and she started going through books and books, all that she had, nothing. The chairman of the museum's board was even dismissive. They said, hey, man, it's nothing but an old rock cod. Get rid of it. I'm going home for Christmas. But she was convinced that she had found something. She knew this wasn't, re- wasn't normal, wasn't what it was supposed to be. So she took it to the local morgue where they were going to try to store it. Well, they wouldn't. So she had it taxidermied. That's the only thing she needed to do to try to keep it as best she could. So she calls up the museum curator of fish on the coastal South Africa named J.L.B. Smith. But, of course, he wasn't there because it's too close to Christmas. Well, he didn't return her call, so the next day she wrote him, and she included a sketch of what she had. Now, what followed is insane. That By January 9th, Smith wrote her and said, Hey, this fish has caused me a lot of sleepless nights, and I have to see it. And I am more than ever convinced on the reflection that your fish is more primitive form than we've ever discovered. And waited all the way until February 16th. And that's when he arrived at their museum where she worked. And he wrote that although I had come prepared, the first sight of this fish hit me like a white hot blast that made me feel shaky and queer and my body tingled. I stood as if stricken to stone. Yes, there was not a shadow of doubt. Scale by scale, bone by bone, fin by fin, it was a true coelacanth. Just a short 66 million years later, y'all, 66 million years, it is thought that it was extinct. And she found it on the coast in a pile of fish. So I leave you to think about that. All the things that we believe are gone, just like this fish, lay dormant for 66 million years. And in 1938, only a few days before Christmas, Marjorie found it. And that's kind of what we have to base our ideas on to keep an open mind. Keep thinking, keep looking, keep researching, keep diving, digging, beating the bush. Hope you all enjoyed that. Take a quick break. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we are back. Oh, I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, It's cool. The the Mer Horse. Look, man, it's like we always talk about. Lake monsters, I don't know if I'm still so big into lake monsters. Sea monsters, yeah, I can buy the sea monster bit, man. I just, the sea is huge, man. Yeah, it's the, the, enormous. Yeah. You know, when you were telling these stories, it reminds me of like Carl Schuker's work. Yep. A couple of the books he's yep. got with crazy animals like that, things that people have seen. Uh, if you should check him out, Carl, that's K A R L. You remember Shuker. we were going to have Carl, and then he was going yeah. through that whole deal with his mom, and his was, mother passed and then away. He was, and, and then he was having some kind of surgery on his, on his eyes. eyes. Yeah, yeah, so it was just a real bad time. But we should hit him up, because that was like four years ago. He might yeah. be down now. We need to get Carl on. And I think he just released a new book, actually. I think so. 
I think I we saw need to get that. Carl on. Yeah, uh, for sure. Me and Luke are going to we're going to the movies uh, tomorrow. We're going to go watch Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. I don't. What, I don't know what it is. He showed me the trailer. That but, looks creepy. My my wife wants to see that. Well, She's been talking about that. Luke's pumped up about it. He wanted to see the new Child's Play, but I think it's already out of theaters. So he was bummed about that. But I like seriously, Luke is like the next George Romero. I mean, he like does. He's not frightened by these no, scary movies. No. Mm-mm. He loves it. It doesn't. Bother Did you see the, the picture? Least. The picture I posted on Instagram with he's got the creep show comic. I, I came over the other day and he <laughs> whipped it out. He's like Uncle Cam, and he comes running up, and I was like, Oh God! <laughs> yeah, he shows that to everybody, and he shows it to kids, and they're like, I don't know what that is. It's a horror movie from the eighties. They yeah. have no clue. Oh, he's about it, about it. He's he loves it. He's found this one show. What was he watching called The Stuff? It looks like shaving cream attacking people. Who knows? Dude, he he is eat up. You know what though? I really don't understand. Like, I know his mother likes scary movies, but where does this come from? I mean, like, it's not like he just loves the scare because there's other scary movies that I would ask him if he's like, no, I don't like that one. I mean, it's like there's a cert. I don't know, man. It's weird. It really is like he's an old movie director that's reborn in, the, in that little kid's body. Harry Housen. Yeah. That's, he's reincarnated. He's Ray Harry Housen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's, he's going to do special effects. Oh. Or Tom Savini. He's going to be like that. That's, you know what? That's who you need to take him to go get and go meet. You need to go out there to go meet Tom well, Savini. Well, I told you, the next time they have, the, they have that one big festival in Dallas every year. And it, what's it called? Is I it don't Fright know. Fest? Something like that. I think I'm going to take him there because you we can need, meet guys that are Lyle in the movies. Goes. We need to hit Lyle up because yeah. Lyle goes. So we need to hit Lyle and go, hey, when are you and Lyle? Uh, Luke and Lyle can can date. They can go over there to that thing because they're the only two kids that's not afraid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. That's cool. What do you got planned for your weekend? Man, recover. Yeah, just, just recover. chilling. Yeah. I don't have a lot of plans this weekend. Uh, besides the fact it's just so stinking hot, I don't want to get out yeah. and do a whole lot. But I really don't have a lot of big plans this week. I'm weekend. gonna be watching just, the Predator Marathon with my dad and boys. And I then guess next that's weekend, my plans Sunday. The following weekend is the beginning of like college football, so that'll be exciting. Yeah. Next weekend I've got some plans because my daughter her birthday's next week. Right so, on. So and uh so that'll be it. So we'll we'll go do something with her and all that stuff. And then school starts next week. Yeah. Yeah. Here and then of course she goes back to college and does all that stuff. So yeah, that's I don't really have any any crazy plans coming up until it cools off. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Well, if you got any stories you'd like to share with me and Cam, please email the show at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com or you can call the show 817-945-3828. Till next time, folks, be careful out there. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hill. He's y'all.